So Blake read scripture for us this morning from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. And in that scripture, we heard about Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And that is what Palm Sunday is kind of set aside for, it's kind of set apart for, for us to stop and think about and remember and reflect on that triumphant entry, entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Palm branches waving and people cheering and people yelling, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I mean, it was just really a full-on party, you know, just an old-fashioned kind of party going on with everyone excited and everyone as happy as they can be and everyone there kind of with their own expectations of how it's going to turn out. You know, their own ideas kind of their own what's best for us. Jesus has come to make sure that we get what's best for us, right? I'm going to tell you that um, I can create like whole scenarios in my head, right? (laughs) And make them like a a conversation, like where somebody's going to say something and then I'm going to say this and then they're going to say this and I'm going to say that. And I've heard that this is kind of a a girl thing to do, but I'm slightly offended by that because I know guys that do it too. Um, But this is an example of it. My my mom's birthday was this past Wednesday. And so I kind of made the decision on Tuesday that I would drive to Brenham. Her favorite flowers are yellow roses. I would have yellow roses already in my car, right? And I would drive all the way to Brenham. And right about the time I came into Brenham, I would call her on my cell phone just to check to see where she was and to make sure she was going to stay right there. So this is how it all worked out in my head. I would call and I would be like, hi, mom, what are you doing? And she would say, oh, I'm just here at the house. And then I would say, oh, really, you're not going anywhere? And she would say, no, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just kind of hanging out here. And then I would say, okay, well, uh, be sure and check Facebook because I put a picture of you when you graduated from high school on my Facebook page and said happy birthday to you. So check that out and I'll talk to you soon. And you're sure you're not not going anywhere? And she's going to say, no, I'm not going anywhere. Perfect. So then I would ring the doorbell, right? And she would come to the door And I would be standing there with her yellow roses. And she would say something like, you're the best daughter in the world. (laughs) Right? That's how that's the whole thing is going to go exactly like that. Right? Um, So I told Robert about it on Tuesday night. And he's in the kitchen with me. And finally he just turns and looks at me. And this is what he said. I really hope this turns out as happy for you in real life as it has been in your mind. And it was happy, but nothing went quite the way. You know, my mom said, I'm not going anywhere. That's what she said. I'm not going anywhere. And so I, I'm like right by the house when she said that. And I, so I park in the driveway and sneak around to the front door and ring the doorbell. And in the meantime, she goes out through the garage and sees my car. She should have told me that she was on her way to Walmart. Anyway, <laughs> um, We all have, you know, these expectations, um, these ideas of how things are supposed to work out. And um, I don't think there's a person alive that hasn't done that to some degree. We place our own expectations onto someone else. And sometimes, you know, um, we call it our hopes and our dreams. You know, parents do it. For their parents have hopes and dreams for their kids. When I do premarital counseling with couples, uh, I'm, I'm here to tell you that couples have some relati- relatively specific hopes and dreams for each other, uh, for their future spouse. Um, and this scripture is speaking today of some very deeply rooted expectations, some very deeply long time grounded hopes and dreams. For what the Messiah would do and who he would be and how he would act. Everyone certainly knew um, that the Messiah, that Jesus would make all wrongs right. He would oppress the oppressors. He would punish the wicked. Surely everyone knew that the Savior that God was sending to them would be victorious over all their enemies. Anyone who rejected and denied him. And he would bring justice for all of those who had been treated so unjustly. All these hopes and expectations for Jesus were wrapped up, wrapped up in some self-motivation and some ideas for how things could be. With really no actual idea of how the story would go, of how the story would go. The people shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord with little to no understanding of God's actual plan. And before we're quick to criticize anyone, we stand here today with history, the understanding and the experience of history on our side, and yet we still way too often do exactly the same thing. Have expectations, have hopes and dreams, have expectations for what Jesus will do for us. And when it doesn't happen, then we sometimes wonder, is it real? Is the story real? And we begin to doubt. No matter what specifically our own expectations have been in the moment, we want Jesus to meet them exactly the way we've decided they should go. And just like that day, the conversation between me and my mom, we have it all set. And I don't know what everybody's expectations personally were on that day in that moment, but I feel pretty sure that none of them on Palm Sunday, none of them on that day in that moment thought that death on a cross was in the future. I think we can be pretty sure that death on the cross was not on anybody's mind that stood there that day waving those palm branches and shouting Hosanna. We waved palm branches today. The children came through and they waved the palm branches and we sang music we do that in remembrance, and we do it in celebration as well. But again, we have history on our side. We know what the future held. We, we know what was about to happen. You see, they, they did not have the story in Mark 15. Blake read to us this morning from Mark 11, verses 1 through 11, of all that happened on that, on that Palm Sunday. And they, they didn't have the story of Mark 15. This morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to remain seated. Because I'm not going to just read this um, particular passage. I'm going to tell it to you. Kind of in the way that it happened on that day. And I want to invite you, um, during the reading and the telling of this passage, to be in this moment and to listen closely to all the things that are in this passage. The soldiers led Jesus into the courtyard of the palace. And when they did, they called together all the people, all the cohorts. And they took Jesus and they clothed him in a purple cloak. They took some thorns and they twisted them together. And then they forced them onto his head. They all began saluting him, mocking him, and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with reeds. They spat upon him. And they knelt down, mockingly, paying homage to him. After they had finished mocking Jesus, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him out to crucify him. They found a passerby named Simon, and they compelled him to come and carry Jesus' cross for him. And they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he refused it. And they crucified him. And they divided his clothes among them, and they cast lots to see which thing each person would take. It was, it was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified Jesus. The inscription of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by mocked him, shaking their heads and saying, Oh yeah, you're the one who said that you would destroy the temple and then rebuild it in three days. Why don't you save yourself now and come down from that cross? In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him. And they were saying things among themselves like, he saved others. Now he can't even save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. 
When it was noon, darkness came and fell across the whole land until three o'clock in the afternoon. At three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, listen, he's calling for Elijah to come down. So they ran and they got a sponge and they filled it with sour wine and they put it on a stick and they gave it to Jesus, saying, wait, wait, let us see if Elijah will come to take him down from this cross. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and he breathed his last breath. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, when the centurion who stood facing Jesus saw that in this way he breathed his last breath, the centurion said, truly, this man is the son of God. Truly, this man is the son of God. Jesus gives out a loud cry, breathes his last breath. The curtain of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. And the man who's standing at the foot of the cross, the centurion, who is a soldier. Centurion means he was a captain over a hundred other soldiers. We have no idea what his level of participation was in all these things we've read about. But he's standing right there. Facing Jesus, he hears the sounds, he smells the smells, he knows from firsthand experience exactly what's happening in that moment, and his response to it all is truly, this man was the Son of God. Let's pray together. God, we come before you this morning asking you to speak to our hearts and minds. Asking you to make for us very real what our response is when we stand at the foot of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, they say that a picture's worth a thousand words. A picture's worth a thousand words. Um, and we've kind of come to accept that in our culture because a picture really can kind of convey very quickly um, what a, what, what's happening in that moment without, with very little, maybe even no explanation whatsoever. A picture is worth a thousand words. I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. I still just think there's nothing that can replace actually being there, you know, you know? like actually being in the moment. I love to take pictures oh, with my cell phone. In fact, I kind of drive my kids a little bit crazy because this is sort of my attitude. Like if we don't get a picture of it, it didn't happen. You know, and so I'm always like, oh, 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 let me get a picture. I've got it in my pocket all the time or somewhere near where any, mo you know, moment that's, that's special or just cool, I got to have a picture of it. Um, I didn't get to go to College Station to have lunch with my son uh, in early March for his birthday because I was I was ill, so I went after uh, the day after I had uh, went to see my, after I went to see my mom I had lunch with our son Lee, and of course we have a wonderful lunch together we have a great discussion and a great talk and when we get up to leave Wings and More in College Station Texas I said let's get a picture, <laughs> and Lee's like could you just not post it this time mom could you not post the picture you don't have to post everything on Instagram that we do. And so I, I look at the picture, and I, I didn't post it. Um, but these pictures, you know, when I look at them and I, I, look out, I get out my phone and look through these pictures, they bring back really a thousand words worth of memories. Like each picture, I remember the conversation. I can remember the facial expression of my son when we talked and remember the sound of his laugh. And I love pictures. I think that sometimes they say even more than a thousand words. At the same time, I still would maintain that um, it doesn't replace being there. Being right there in that moment, there's no way to replace being there. And there are those moments in life 
when the severity of the moment and the depth of the emotions involved in that moment will not allow you to look away, not even for a moment. You, you wouldn't even dare. As a pastor, I've stood beside so many people as they breathe their last breath. And I have heard and I have seen the holiness in that moment. Being right there kind of changes things. It, it rearranges perspectives and, and priorities. I've known from, first, um, from the very first experience of that, that I was standing on holy and hallowed ground. I wouldn't have dared look away. When 17-year-old Tim Curley breathed his last breath with his parents on one side of the bed and me standing on the other, the severity of that moment, the emotion that was involved, the depth of that emotion, the understanding that we all had, all four of us, of being on holy ground, would not have allowed any one of us to look away, not even for a moment. That centurion was right there. He was right there in that moment. He heard it all. He saw it all. And he didn't dare look away. He didn't dare look away. He heard Jesus cry his last cry. He saw and heard Jesus take his last breath. He was right there in that moment and it changed him. He was a changed man as a result of it. It rearranged his priorities. It, it changed his beliefs. It changed his perspective. He's right there and he became, it gave him a new heart, a new life, a new man. He says, surely this man is the son of God. What a difference in that centurion's life. Sometimes I'm concerned that we as a people just kind of want a snapshot of Easter. Do you know what I mean? We kind of want to go from Palm Sunday where we're waving the branches and the children are singing and it's so, it's just so wonderful. It's such, it's such a happy Sunday. We want to go right from that to Easter where it's so happy and we're celebrating the resurrection. And sometimes I wonder if we're getting to a place where we've even stopped believing that Jesus died. Because we go from his triumphant entry to his resurrection. I was talking to a friend of mine about this this week, and he said, and they were telling me about a friend of theirs that he called a church years ago on a Good Friday, called a church and said, hey, uh, what time is your Good Friday service? And the receptionist was really kind of confused. She's like, what are you talking about? He said, don't you have a Good Friday service? I'd like to come to a Good Friday service. And she told him, at this church, we celebrate the resurrection. Well, at every church, we celebrate the resurrection, right? I mean, we all celebrate the resurrection. It doesn't matter what church it was or what denomination it was. It doesn't matter because it might be easy for some of us to be like, oh, you know, that's just those non-denoms for you, you know? But here we are, United Methodists, many of us celebrating Palm Sunday, celebrating the resurrection, and never allowing ourselves to stand at the foot of the cross. Never allowing ourselves to be in that deep moment of emotion and stark reality because we all know it's sometimes too hard. The longest journey is the journey to the graveside. And so many of us don't want to do that. We let a picture say a thousand words for us rather than being right there in the moment. As a matter of fact, church attendance across the nation has declined on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. Now, I'm happy to tell you this about, about you guys. Over the last several years, the attendance here has increased on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, so way to go. But as a nation, um, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, attendance is on the decline. People like the party and the pictures while avoiding those moments so deeply powerful that you do not dare look away. You do not dare look away. 
I want, to, I want to invite you and strongly encourage you this year to take that journey. You can actually begin tonight. Tonight at 5 o'clock on the, in the south side, on the south, in the south sanctuary, there's a worship service taking place at 5 o'clock with dinner that follows. And let me tell you how amazing this is going to be. It's a worship service that's specifically designed to help children understand Easter and help parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and neighbors and friends explain Holy Week to children. I, this is a wonderful experience. I, I hope that you'll begin this, this Passion Week by, by being in that worship service specifically designed to help children understand Easter. And maybe that would be good for all of us to kind of start there. On Maundy Thursday, we will gather together here and we're going to be doing something a little bit differently this year. We're going to line some of the chairs up so that when we receive communion together as a body of believers, you can receive that while kneeling. And we're going to talk about and explore what happened on that Monday, Thursday, and what happened when Jesus was with his disciples and they shared in the Last Supper together. And then on Good Friday, we're going to come together And we're going to take the opportunity to stand at the foot of the cross. To allow ourselves to be in that moment of reality where we wouldn't dare look away. I believe that if we do not walk that journey that Jesus walked and we do not reflect and feel and be in that moment like the centurion was right there and in that moment then I believe that the true joy of Easter will somehow be more shallow. It will lack the depth that it could hold when we hold the burden in our hearts. Now, let me be very clear. I want everyone to understand this. Because of the resurrection, because of the resurrection, we don't stay in those moments. But we do not stay away from them either. And because of the resurrection, we don't choose to live there. We don't live at Good Friday, but we don't choose to live without it either. The complete story is all of it. Had that centurion been in any other place in that moment, had he been so distant that looking away was an easy option for him, his heart would have never been changed in that particular moment. And that is true for us. It's true for us. A picture may say a thousand words. I can definitely agree with that. But nothing can replace being there. Nothing can replace being right there in that moment, standing at the foot of the cross, not daring to look away. And this is what I think happens for us when we allow ourselves. I've, heard, I've just heard so many stories about people making themselves distant when things get difficult. People running away when things get hard. And then I know people who walk through some of the most painful experiences in life. And they, and they, and they stay together and, and they walk that journey together. And they walk that journey with God. And, and it somehow ch changes our hearts and changes our perspectives. I think that if we celebrate today which I believe that we have, that we have done. As the children, I, I don't know, I can't speak for you. I'm not that controlling. Um, but I can speak for myself. And when I hear the voices of children singing in worship, there's just something that, I don't know, it just makes my heart feel a little bit happy. You know what I'm, not a little bit. That's not true. Like a lot happy. Like a lot. And, um, so I hope that that's been worshipful for you this morning as we've talked about what happened on Palm Sunday as the people waved the branches as they celebrated but with their own expectations. And I would ask you this morning, is that, is that how that works for you when you worship and when you pray? 
Is it always with your own expectations? Or are you ready to take that journey, that journey with Jesus that says, you know, I know you're with me. I know you're by my side. And that no matter what happens, I'll stand at the foot of the cross and I'll say, truly and surely, this man is the son of God. Let's pray together. God, we do thank you and we praise you for your son, Jesus. We thank you, God, that when he rode into Jerusalem on that day, he did know. He did know what the future would hold. And yet because of love and because of our need for grace and forgiveness, he took that journey. And so, God, help us to be people who do that as well. Help us to be people who are, who are willing, who are ready to stand at the foot of the cross and be people who cry out, this is, this is the Son of God. We love you, God. We thank you so much for loving us. And we pray, God, that you begin a work in each one of our hearts and minds this Passion Week, that when we come here on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, or Saturday night to celebrate Easter, that, God, we come having walked that journey, having experienced the depth and the emotion of all that your son Jesus experienced so long ago, so that Easter can be of the truest and the purest joy because we have held the burden in our hearts and then we have turned it over to you at the foot of the cross. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.